Oh, what's the matter, you? This is a nicer place. <laughs> Turn to your neighbor and say, what's the matter, you? <laughs> Uh, you know, David was asking himself this very question, and he, he, was, he was talking to himself. And, and I, know, I know some of you, with me, some of the best conversations we've ever had in our entire being was the one you had with yourself. Right? And you're carrying on this conversation, and you're speaking to yourself. And I've, I've asked myself this very question, what's the matter with you? And some of you say, well, I can help you with that. I can, I can, I can, <laughs> you get just a little bit of time, I can explain that to you. But David, he is, he's drilling down on this and he's, because he's going through it. So he's going through some situations, circumstances, bring some weight, some discouragement. And because that weight of discouragement was upon him, it was affecting him in everything that he was doing. It was affecting him even in his worship. It was affecting him in how he was interacting with people because of the weight. And this is the good thing about this. It's good to know that there are people in the word of God who are actually human. You know, we read these stories about how they, you know, called down fire from heaven and they shut the lion's mouth. And we see how, how God used them mightily through in and, and, uh, and tremendous situations, circumstances. And we have this ideal that these were people that were so much more than we could ever be. But I got some news for you. They're the same. The reason why they did those things is the same God. The same God then is the same God now. And the same God that moved through them is the same God that's moving through you. And giving you the ability to do what you need to do. Now, Satan knows that. And Satan knows the frailty of the flesh. And so what he desires to do and what he designs to do is to cause you to be removed from the very provision that God has for you so that you can walk in anointing and giftings, that you can walk in freedom, that you can walk in the fullness of the spirit, that you can do what he's called you to do. And so this is where he sets aside. He sets us aside and, and, and tries to manipulate feelings because he cannot overcome and conquer you in the spirit. So the one thing in the one area in the flesh is feelings. And David knew this. He recognized this, and we see this in Psalm 42. Would you turn with me to Psalm 42, verse 3? My tears, this is verse 3, Psalm chapter 42. My tears have been my food day and night. They continually say to me, where is your God? Have you ever heard that lie from the pit? I'm, I'm, I'm talking to those that have stood toe-to-toe -to, -toe to the demonic. I've, I'm talking to those that are overcomers. I'm talking to those that have moved mountains. But there are times, there are times, in the frailty of the flesh, the doubt comes in because of the circumstances, situations that we're walking through, the things that are happening, that we even question, is God still with me? Does God still care? Are you even there, Jesus? When I remember these things, I pour out my soul. I pour out my soul within me. You see, I used to go with the multitude. I used to go up with them to the house of God. And with the voice of joy and the voice of praise, with the multitude, I kept the pilgrim feast. He said, I used to do what God called me. I used to have a passion. I used to pray. I used to be, I used to be in the, the, the provision and the passions of praise. But it's gone. I'm broken. 
discouraged. You see, and I'm going I'm to encourage those of you that are here, especially those that are watching online, the one thing that Satan is bent on doing is removing you from the help that comes from the house. The writer of Hebrews says, do not forsake the fellowshipping of the saints together. And even the more so, as you see that day approaching, as you see this end times that is upon us, you're going to need the help. You're going to need the help of the brothers and sisters. You're going to need some help. Somebody going to pray for you. Somebody's going to come alongside and lift you up. You're going to need an armor bearer. You're going to need one that is carrying the weight with you because you can't do it by yourself. You thought you could. You thought you could stand alone. But, oh, how many have tried? You've tried to walk through the forces of the battle, and you've been wounded and you've been, the arrows are hitting their mark and you're feeling that I'm all alone and I just might as well quit. And that is the target because the enemy knows as he separates you from your help, you're all alone and in a wounded state, not only will you quit, you'll give up. Now you might not be in the place where you turn away from God and you say, I've had it with you, and you lose your salvation, but you will be in the place where you're no longer effective. And you're no longer ministering and reaching the lost and the dying. You're no longer able to encourage your family and your friends. All you are is a shell of what you used to be. Have you been there? Are you understanding what I'm saying? Have you walked through the desert times? Have you walked to the times that you felt you were all alone and that you were abandoned? And David is understanding that I used to go. I used to go up. I used to... I used to go to the, the feasts and, the, and, and do what I was anointed and I was called to do. And now, the only thing that I have in front of me is the discouragement. So he asked himself a very pointed question. And, and, and I would encourage you, those of you that have walked through the valleys that during those times that the Holy Spirit would remind you of this, because I know many of you are doing well. Many of you are in that provision of great faith and mountains are being moved and God is using you mightily and praise God for the highs. Come on, praise God for the winds. I praise God for the times that he, he comes through and we are doing what he's called us to do, even though hell rages, where we are victorious in Jesus Christ. I thank God for the winds, come on. But there are times, there are struggles. And it's during those times that we've got to shake ourselves and ask ourselves a pointed question. And David said, why are you downcast, O oh my soul? And he put his finger on it. It's not in the spiritual realm. It's the soul, his emotions, his feelings. Why are you having a hard time? And it wasn't not just that, not what just cast down. He said, why are you disquieted with me? Why are you discouraged? Why are you despondent? So he's having this conversation, talking to himself. Self, I said, what's the matter, you? Because <laughs> it's not that we don't know this stuff. Come on, help me out, church. It's not that we don't know who our help comes from. It's not that we just all of a sudden figure this. I mean, from the moment you get saved, that light comes on. Oh, this is what they've been talking about. This is the real deal. This is the help. This is the hope. This is the future. This is fire. This is power. This is anointing. This is God showing up. From the very moment that he reveals himself to you, you know all that. It's not that you don't know. So Satan is there to remind himself, come on, man. This is it. Wake up. And then he answers himself. Have you answered yourself? How many ever lost an argument to yourself?
He said, hope in God. Put your hope where there's going to be help. Put your faith in the one that still moves the mountains, that still rescues you. And why are you disquieted? Hope in God. And then he makes a proclamation to himself. And this is said, this is what I'm going to do because I know the way out of this cave. He said, I shall yet praise him. He is the help of my countenance. That's the window of your soul. Look at the face of your neighbor and then tell them you have a lovely face. No, they say, no, really, I mean it. I really mean that. Not just because the preacher said to say that. It's the window of your soul. You know what's going on. Some people are read like a book. You know what I'm talking about? They are, you know exactly what's going on because they'll let you know. They don't have to say a word. You see them, you go, whoa, I need to go the other way. <laughs> or there is joy. They come on and they, they are up on on top, of the, on top of the world and things are going well and the smile is pasted on them. You can see their every tooth in their head and they are happy. And I encourage the happy people this morning. Come on. You happy people, keep being happy. The rest of the knuckleheads need your happiness. They need that smile. It is a rarity today. And, and when you, you see somebody smiling and you're thinking, I wonder what kind of meds they're on. Stuff is going on today. What's going on in their life? You can tell when the joy of the Lord is radiating and you can bless one another and you can encourage one another. He said, I will praise him, the help of my countenance. And then he goes into some very specific things. He said, my God, my soul is cast down within me. So what I'm going to do? I'm going to remember you from the land of the Jordan, from the heights of Hermon, and from the hill Mazar. These are three very specific locations that God intervened for David. Bible scholars believe that in the land of Jordan is in that arena and that area that David was anointed. So I'll remember my anointing. I'll remember my encounter that changed my life. I'll remember the purpose that you put upon me. And I'll remember the future that you had destined me to walk in. And I'll remember the goodness that you have given to me. And all the provision that you have given to me to do what you've called me to do. I'll remember those things. Because in the, in the hurt and the pain, we forget. Ah, we forget in the darkness what God spoke to us in the light. And it's easy just to... to Allow those things to slide and to fall away. But that's why we need to be reminded. And I remind you today how good God is. He is a good God. He's a great God. And then he said, I'll, re I'll remind myself the heights of Hermon. The heights of Hermon. And, and, and Bible scholars believe this is where he encountered the giant. This is where he encountered and he defeated the enemies. So he remembers not only the anointing, but he remembers the power of God. He remembers the provision of God. And then that place, Mazar, as the place of the cave, when he was running for his life, he was anointed. He was given purpose, but yet it wasn't working. It, does, it was not panning out like he had thought it was supposed to happen. 
And now he's running for his very life. And the only people that he has with him is a bunch of other knuckleheads. Rag, tag, bunch of rejects. That's what the Bible called them. Don't look at me that way. And they're hanging out in the cave together and they're running. Running. But he remembers the provision that God gave to him in one of the darkest hours of his life. He said, I remember when you showed up. I'll remember your anointing. I'll remember your provision. I'll remember where you had saved me, where you had rescued me. And I'll remember when you showed up and gave us victory. I'll remind myself of those things because what I'm faced with right now, I know that you are able to do exceedingly abundantly above what I can think or ask. And this giant will fall down too. This giant, just like the rest. No. He was disappointed and he understood that he needed to get past disappointment. And this is so important, folks, and I want to give to this to you. This is so important to hang on to this because I know that the enemy would cause disappointment because after, on the heels of disappointment, you become discouraged. And if you allow discouragement to continue to reign, then disdain begins. And that disdain brings anger. And you get angry. And through anger, and if it is still not able to have a, allow the Lord to bring resolve, to bring healing, to bring help, and you will not turn that over and you continue to walk down that road, bitterness comes in. And bitterness will destroy you. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30. <clears throat> Look at this. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30 says, that, Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. Do you see that? Verse 30, chapter 4, book of Ephesians. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit. Do you know we can grieve the Holy Spirit? There, there are things that we can do that grieves the Holy Spirit. The very one that's bringing you help. The very one that's bringing you out. The very one that's rescuing you and your family. And the very one that has brought life. The third person of the Godhead. That Jesus said, if I don't go, the helper cannot come. And the Holy Spirit has come. And the Holy Spirit has brought power and brought provision and brought hope. Do you know we can grieve the Holy Spirit? And the same one that lit on you will take the flight. You continue to grieve. He said, don't grieve the Holy Spirit by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor. If you wonder what clamor is, that is the rumblings and speaking, the gossiping. He said, don't let the clamor and the evil speaking. Let those things be put away from you. With all malice. Now, I don't have to reiterate these things. I think we all know what that stuff is. Say amen or I'll go through all this stuff. Okay. okay. So that's the first time saying amen in a week. And be kind. Be kind. Well, what kind would you like me to be? <laughs> Be kind to one another. Tender hearted. We can skip the rest, right? Huh. Forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. Everybody deals with disappointment. Everybody. You will be disappointed. You'll be disappointed in every aspect of your life, even the spiritual things, because what happens is it didn't go your way. And I'm disappointed. Somebody let you down. And we get disappointed. Life will unravel real fast. And things turn on a dime. And you get disappointed. But it's how, listen to me. You still with me? You still here? You didn't check out and thinking about something else? 
how you process disappointment determines the blessing and the freedom of your future. I'm going to say that again. Process this, please. How, how you process that disappointment, how you deal with that disappointment. When that disappointment comes in, it will come. How you go through that disappointment will determine the blessing and your freedom of your future. You see, God can still move through disappointment, but God will not move through bitterness. He still can move through your disappointments. He still can show up and bring help and healing because you were just discouraged, you're disappointed. But if you allow anger and bitterness come in, you remove his help. He did not tell us, don't be disappointed because he knows we're going to be disappointed. He said, don't be bitter. Are you still with me? He can still move. He can still move. We have great expectations. God gives us great dreams and visions and things ahead, things to come. And so when those things don't happen the way we think they're supposed to happen, we get disappointed. Oh. What he did say, Ephesians, if, and this is, this is McManus' interpretation. This is Man, McManus' uh, translation. He said, don't be bitter, angry, and talking smack. Nobody going to help me. And there's what the Holy Spirit helped me with. He said, you need to back that attitude up and park it in the dark where it belongs. Right. And all of a sudden, in the spiritual realm, we're hearing beep, beep, beep. <laughs> Bitter people look for problems. But blessed people look for solutions. Bitter people look for the faults. But blessed people look for talents and callings. Did you hear me? Bitter people look for faults. You know, follow me there, Jared. And they're looking because they're bitter. And they're looking. And they have to look really close sometimes. I'm going to find it. Um, here it come. Yep. <laughs> Aha! There is a freckle. You try to cover up with spaghetti sauce, but I see it now. <laughs> I can tell those that are laughing, they know it. And those that are dealing with it, they ain't laughing. <laughs> Bitter people look for faults, but blessed people Look for the talent. Look for the calling. Look for what God is doing in their life. You can find faults in all of us. And for me, you don't have to look very far. It's revealed on a daily basis. You don't believe me? You can ask the one that knows me more than anyone else. And she'll tell you, he messed up. <laughs> He needs help. We all have faults. We all have failures. Let God draw out the blessing. Let God cause you to begin to look at things differently because bitter people Look at the needs not met. They look at all the problems that are around, that are still undone. The needs that have not been met. But blessed people look for opportunities. They see the needs and they don't say, oh, that's a bit. They look for the abilities and they look for the positions and they look for the places that they can minister. Bitter people will look at what they don't have. But blessed people 
look for the promises of tomorrow. I want you to say this with me. I'm not bitter. I'm blessed. Let's say that again. I'm not bitter. I'm blessed. I am not bitter. I am blessed. I am blessed. I am blessed. Now give God praise. Come on. There's something that we use in, in our uh, treatment, in our bees, in, our, in the apiaries. There is a, and I'm not going to do a, a deep um, scientific introduction to you to beekeeping, but I will tell you this, the one thing that is killing bees, the honeybees, more than anything else is a little mite. It's called the varroa. The varroa destructor is the name of this mite. And this mite that is symbiotic with the honeybee actually lives off of eating them alive. They, they attach themselves to their to their underside and they suck the life out of them. And while they're doing that, they inject viruses. There's five different viruses that are injected into the little honeybee. Does that make you sad? I hope it makes you sad. It's the honeybee's wonderful little guy, you know. We love honeybees. Now, there's something that we use and it's a natural treatment called oxalic acid. Oxalic acid is found in a lot of fruits and vegetables like rhubarb, yay for rhubarb, especially if you put it with strawberry and make it into a pie. Praise the Lord, in nombre de Padre, fill the Spirit, Santo, amen. Good stuff. So we use this oxalic acid and it kills, kills the mites, but it's very gentle on the bees. It doesn't hurt the bees, but it kills the mites. So we, we use that. And we, there's different types of treatments that you use with this oxalic acid. And one of them is we use what they call extended treatment, and you mix it with vegetable glycerin, heat it up to about uh, 100, 170 degrees, and, the, and it emulsifies the oxalic acid, which comes in a powder form, into this vegetable gl glycerin. Then you put it on these uh, Swedish sponges, and you place them in the hive. And so over time, the, as, as the bees come in contact with it, it kills the mites. And so that's, that's kind of what we're using right now, and it's working pretty good. But the, the problem with that is, is that when you're working with this acid, it'll burn you. You get it on any part of your skin, it burns. Not like muriatic acid, like right away, but you know, over time, it'll, it'll, it'll start, it'll, it'll give you a, a second degree burn if you don't deal with it right. And if it splashes into your eyes, it could be very, very uh, volatile, even blinding. So what we use is we make sure we have some baking soda and some water whenever we're doing that, because baking soda neutralizes acid. If you didn't know that, baking soda neutralizes acid, all kinds of acid, battery acid, muriatic acid, it neutralizes it. And so if something gets splashed on you, well, you take some of that baking soda water and you wash it and it just instantly is gone. And the Lord began to speak to me. He said, what we need in the body today across our nation and across this world because the enemy is trying to bring a toxic acid of bitterness into our lives to cause us to be separated from one another and no longer walking in unity because he knows if he can divide from within that he can conquer the church. And what we need is the blessed provision of baking soda. <laughs> Somebody said, well... What are you going to do? Just spread it on there. As you go out, we're going to anoint you with baking soda in Jesus' name. No. The Holy Spirit is the baking soda of God that neutralizes the toxic acid of bitterness from the demonic. The presence and the provision of the Holy Spirit, but not just say, well, that's easy to say, the Holy Spirit. But there's great provisions in the ministry of the Holy Spirit. You see, I'm going to tell you now how to neutralize bitterness in your life. Amen. Some are excited about this. I am, because when the Lord started giving me this, I said, man, I need some of that, because it's so easy to get offended. It seems that it's easier now to get offended than ever before. I find myself, just all of a sudden, it rising up within me, and I said, what's going on here, McManus? And I have to ask myself again, what's the matter you? This is not right. I should not be feeling this. I should not be getting uptight over trivial things. 
There's a litmus test. You want a litmus test of what really matters in your life? Two seconds after you're in heaven with Jesus, if it would not matter at that moment what you're dealing with, if it's not going to matter then, it really don't matter now. If when I'm in his presence, if this frustration is not going to mean anything, then why is it causing me problems now? Here is the baking soda found again in verse 32. And be kind to one another. Someone once told me, I'm killing them with kindness, but it's taken too long. (sighs) Okay. You see, kindness is a state of mind and heart. It is something that you must put on. It is not something that comes naturally. Kindness is not, and some people say, well, they're just kind. That's the way God made them. No. No. They have chosen to be kind. It's something that you have to choose, to be kind. Especially, and right now, right now, there are many people that are already thinking about individuals that God is challenging you to be kind to. Because it's been really hard to be kind to that person. And you tried and you had to bite your tongue. But right now, the Holy Spirit is saying, you want bitterness to be removed? You don't want to walk down that path? You don't want bitterness to overtake you? You don't want to be the one that the enemy is destroying from within? Choose to be kind. Put that on like a garment. God, I put on your kindness. Not mine, not, not the kind that I think I should be, but you're, have you been kind to me, Jesus? When you should not have? Lord, help me to be kind to others. I'm not going to give kindness out of a promise that I'll return and it'll be given back to me. But I give that, knowing that as I do that, it unravels any manipulation and attack in my mind from the enemy. The second thing is a tender heart. I need to have a tender heart. He said, tender hearted. Be kind to one another and tender-hearted. To have a tender heart, I must walk in grace. Everything about my life needs to be bathed and housed in grace. To be graceful to those, to give grace. And I cannot do that without mercy. Has God been merciful to you? Have you received mercy? Will you choose to give mercy? Will you choose to give grace? And the Lord has recently challenged me in this. Because oftentimes it's not a matter of right and wrong. Defining the letter of the law and being, well, by grace, this is what's going to happen. When the Lord says, no, you need to extend mercy. And you need to be merciful. Because what you sow is what you're going to reap. I know. So I choose to walk in grace and have a tender heart. That's much more difficult. And some of the men here... I need to be a manly man doing manly things. And tenderhearted is not on the list of being done. They're going to take my man card if I say that. I'll challenge you. It's much more difficult to walk in that humility of tenderheartedness than it is just to be that macho, outward, tough guy. Everybody tries to do that. But humility is power under grace. Third thing he said there to be tender hearted again. The second thing is tender hearted. The third thing is to forgive as you have been forgiven. 
That's what he said, forgiving one another. To forgive as you've been forgiven. So how have I been forgiven? God has forgiven me. He's taken my sin and he's removed it from me as far as the east is from the west, never to be remembered against me again. And when I, and so he said, I want you to forgive as you've been forgiven. And so if I'm going to do that, it's, it's some people say, well, I'm going to forgive him, but I'm not forgetting. That's oh, the whole idea. Well, you know, fool me once. That's shame on you. Fool me twice. That's shame on me. I should not allowed you to do that. I should have. That's not forgiveness. Forgiveness is choosing to be vulnerable again, which is very difficult to do. But that's how he forgave us. He doesn't remember those things against you. He doesn't have that written down. Well, yeah, I'm going to forgive him maybe if they start acting better. Now, once you've repented, it's forgiven like it never happened. Isn't that awesome? I mean, that's forgiveness to you. Nod your head. Yes, that's really good. I get to go to heaven because of that forgiveness. I get to walk in blessing because of forgiveness. I am healed because of his forgiveness. I am graced with his provision and his presence and his anointing because of his forgiveness. And now he's telling me to unravel this bitterness and this hatred and this envy. I need to forgive. And it's an act of the choice and the will. It's not anything about f feeling. Some people say, well, I'm really not feeling it right now because they're really bad. They're knuckleheads, and I really don't want to do that right now. I think maybe later I'll try. No, you, it's, a, it's an act of your will. I choose to forgive. I choose to forgive them and begin to walk it out. Because forgiveness is not for them, it's for you. As you forgive, you'll be forgiven. And you'll be released of the weight and the anxiety. You'll be released of the weight of the bitterness. Be released of the weight of the anger. The moment you said, okay, I release it. Well, they didn't ask to be forgiven. That's, that's not part of the contract. That's not what the direction of the Lord has is, is given us. Love them that hate you. Do good to them who despitefully use you. Man, we don't like those chapters and those verses. Come on, man. Let's, let's go back to the, you know, in the beginning, God created, and those things are really good, and we can talk about the unicorns that aren't around anymore. Let's go back to that stuff, okay? That's all well and good, but what you need is some help right at this moment because the enemy is trying to destroy you from within. He's trying to bring division in your life and your heart. And all we have to do is just say, okay, God, I recognize this attack and I, I choose not to allow this to rule me. I choose, not, I choose not to allow this to be part of my life. I'm not that person. Come on, church. You're not those people. You're, you're not those that have been steeped in the bondages of sin and darkness. You are the redeemed. You have been graced with the love and the power of Jesus Christ. You walk in fullness. You walk in joy. You walk in provision. That's who you are. That's not you. That stuff, that stuff, send it back. Release it and send it back to whence it came. And walk in the grace and walk in the goodness and walk in the mercy that God has given to you. That's who you are. He said, now to elevate your perspective. And this is what David said. I lift mine eyes to the hills which come my strength. So I'm going to lift up my perspective. I'm not, I'm not going to look at and focus on the, the, the hurt and the pain and the problems. But I'm going to look to the help. I'm going to look to the healing. I'm going to look to the direction that gives me the release and the hope that I need. You see, I'm going to choose to see things from the other side. My perspective, my perspective is I'm always seeing from me. I'm always seeing from my flesh, from my, my hurt, my pain. So I'm going to stand up and I'm going to look at the, the whole entire circumstances, situation. And if I can see the situation from their angle, from their side, from their view, I, it brings understanding. I understand Desperate people do stupid things. Hurting people hurt others. And if I choose to understand that and walk in mercy and grace instead of taking everything personal, and that is I'm going to elevate my perspective and I can see where they're coming from. I can see what's going on in their life. It brings understanding. And that helps me walk in grace. And it helps me walk in mercy. And it helps me walk with tender heart. Is, is this all right? 
Are you, are you are receiving something this morning? That's good because we're almost done. I need to learn. I'm going to, I'm traveling through the land of disappointment. I need to learn how to travel through the land of disappointment. I got four things and we're done. Are you ready? Number one, don't stop. I'm going to get through this disappointment so it doesn't lead to discouragement, so it doesn't lead to bitterness. I'm going to get through this disappointment. And so I'm going to continue to move through. I'm not going to stop. I'm not going to dwell on it. I'm not going to rest in it. I'm not going to wait for anything. I'm going to drive on. I'm not going to get stuck. You will only be stuck if you stop. I like that. Stephen Furtick preached about that a couple weeks ago. You're only going to get stuck if you stop. I'm going to drive on. Second thing is you need to focus your faith, not your feeling. Focus your faith. Focus on your faith, your passion, your direction, your purpose, and not my feelings. When I focus on my feelings, I'm, I'm a mess, okay? I'm a, I'm a disaster. And how many of you with me and saying, yeah, that's me, okay, when I, when I do that. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to shift gears. I'm going to say, well, I'm not going down that road no more. I'm going to focus on the things that I know that work. The provision of the future, the hope, the help, the healing. That's my faith in you, Jesus. Number three, I'm going to trust the process. i got to trust the process that God has me in. In other words, there's a disappointment for a reason. This happened for a reason. Do you know the footsteps are ordered? Your footsteps are ordered. God has even ordained the very footsteps, the directions that you go, the things that happen in your life. It's ordained. If you are under the covering and you are a child of the living God and you are following him, then everything that happens to you is ordered of God. The good, praise the Lord, and the bad, praise the Lord. In everything, give thanks for it's the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Everything. Not just the good stuff. And we thank God for the good stuff. Come on. But the difficult stuff, the times that we're struggling, the times that are overwhelmed, I'm going to give him praise because there's a purpose behind this. Either he's challenging me to build my faith and bring a different understanding or to glean a provision so I'm enlarged, so I can receive a greater blessing, a greater anointing, a greater fervorance. I'll give him praise because I know this won't last. This storm will be over. I don't know what tomorrow holds. I know who holds tomorrow, and he's going to cause the sun to shine. The waves will stop. The storm will cease, and he'll carry me through this. i got to remember, trust the process. Come on, trust the process. And the last thing this morning, as you stand with me, come on, stand with me. I'm going to prove the plan. I'm going to prove the plan. What does that mean? God's got a plan? Is it a good plan? So we say, I hope. <laughs> so far, so good. Come on. He's carried you this far. He's been with you this far. He ain't backing off now. He's rescued you. He's delivered you. He's healed you. He's forgiven you. Everybody else give up on you. But he carried you through it all. So I'm going to trust his plan. And I'm going to prove it by walking in it and allowing him to fulfill it. I'm going to subject and submit my heart to him. Say, Jesus, I want to walk that's blessed and not bitter. We could all be bitter about something because terrible things happen to good people and we can let bitterness destroy us or we can choose to release it and say, Jesus, I'm going to walk in blessing. And if that's you this morning and you're choosing blessing, 
over bitterness. Step out from where you're at. Just by coming and standing with me at this altar, you're making a proclamation to the Lord and saying, I'm walking in blessing, and I'm going to leave the bitterness behind. I'm leaving the bitterness behind me, and I'm going to step out and trust you in the purpose and trust you in the plan that you have for me. Because you are who you say that you are. And as you come, I want you to pray this prayer out loud. Dear Jesus, I thank you for the provision of the Holy Spirit. You have helped me. You have provided. You've encouraged. And you have shown me these things so that I might walk in blessing. I choose blessing. And I ask you, in Jesus' name, in my heart, do a work. Remove the bitterness and allow your Holy Spirit to neutralize every remnant of that bitterness, of anger and malice. In Jesus' name, I look to you and I ask, do the work in me. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Give him praise. Come on. Give him praise. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. That's who you are. I said, that's who you are. You're blessed. You are blessed by God. You're blessed in the purposes that he has for you. He has called you. He's separated you. He has anointed you. And he has given you fullness and direction. And all we're doing today is saying, Satan, we're not going to give you a part. We're not going to allow you to deter us. You're not going to allow you to bring a stop to what God is doing. And I will choose. I will choose blessing. I will choose blessing every day of my life. I'll get up and when the enemy's messing with me and messing with my mind, messing with my finances, messing with my family, messing with, I will say in Jesus' name, I'm not going to allow it to take me. I'm not going to allow it to mess with me. I'm not going to allow it to overwhelm me. I'm not going to allow, I'm not going to allow a foothold. I'm not going to open the door. I'm going to say I am blessed and I am favored and I walk with the king. And bitterness has no place in my life. So in Jesus' name, I release it. Lift up a hand and say, I release it. And I give it to you, Jesus. And I ask for the purpose and the help and the healing now. Father, I thank you for these that have called upon your name. These that have looked to you. You have spoke to them and they responded to your spirit. And I know that you have heard from heaven. And there's some release that has taken place right now. There's some healing that has taken place right now. But you're lifting some weight. You're lifting some hurt that has been taking place for decades, but it's melting away. And they're going to walk out of this place changed. At this altar, every remnant of bitterness will be neutralized in the presence of your Holy Spirit and healing and hope and help and unity and wholeness is coming back into their lives. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Because He's good. Church, I open these altars. If you would just like to spend a little bit of time in it, kneel down, sit down, it doesn't matter, but I open these altars because I know the Lord would like to speak to you and to encourage you and to let you know that he's with you and that he is causing these things that you have committed today. He's causing these things to be sealed. And Satan cannot use this against you. And he is bringing healing and wholeness into your mind and your heart. Let him speak to you. Those of you that need to go, just lift your hands. I want to bless you out. Father in heaven, I thank you for these. You bless them coming in. Now bless them as they go out. Bless them in the city. Bless them at home. May you go before them and prepare the pathway. That you bless them in all that they do, their hands says to do. Lord, that you give them strength. I ask that healing and health and wholeness would rest upon them. Sickness and disease be broken off right now in Jesus' name. Would not come near them nor neither dwelling place. 
Lord, I'm also asking that you would give to them all that they need according to your riches and glory. According to your word, you said give, and it shall be given, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. Would you open up the heavens and provide? Lord, I also ask that you would encourage and strengthen them. Lord, that you would meet with them on a daily basis and speak into their lives. Let them know that you love them and you're providing all that they need. And as they go, they go now in your blessing. For I pray in Jesus' name, the Lord bless you, the Lord bless you, the Lord bless you. Could you give him praise some more time? Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Again, I open these altars. Spend some time if you'd like to as you go. Just say to somebody as you hug their neck, you are blessed in Jesus' name.